addresses. Uh, this is our October, mm -hmm. yes, our October monthly meeting. So welcome for our October monthly meeting. Uh, tonight we will be having Mackenzie Harris talking to us about a new perspective on mental health. Uh, before we do that, I want to go through some general announcements about what we have coming up uh, at Navi North Texas within the next month or two. Uh, our big one is going to be uh, the Texas uh, NAMI conference, which will be in Frisco on November 3rd through the 5th, which is a, I think, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, that will be kicked off by the uh, world premiere of PTSD 911, which is a documentary about trauma in the first responder field. NAMI North Texas was a part of uh, helping to provide not just content, but also resources for that documentary. So that's going to be premiering at the Irving Arts Center on uh, Thursday night the 3rd. Uh, you can find more information about the event at our website, namingnorthtexas.org. You can also go to namingtexas.org to get information from them as well. Uh, our programs are going smoothly uh, for the fall cycle. We are coming up on uh, about halfway through most of our classes. Our support groups are going well. We are actually getting some more trainers trained up and ready to go. So we should be expanding our support groups here within the next couple of months. So uh, that is all the announcements that I have for today. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Mackenzie Harris up to the stage. Oh, oh yeah, everyone, this is my service son, Dale. Yeah, he's the best boy. He is the best. He's actually presenting today. Yeah, he's actually his presentation. So I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and go ahead and take a look. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, welcome everyone. I honestly am so honored that you are here, um, especially on a weeknight. Mm -hmm. I know you have a lot of things you could be doing. So thank you for coming and learning with uh, me and getting to know what I'm extremely passionate about. So my name is Mackenzie Harris. I'm a registered dietitian um, and certified eating disorder specialist. So um, I work for Connections of Wellness during the day. It's a mental health um, company that has private practice, PhD, IOP for mental health, eating disorders, trauma, you name it. Happy to talk to you guys about all of that later. Um, but my um, job at Connections and also in my private practice nurse with nutrition therapy is to work with clients with disordered eating. I actually used, uh, I learned a new word at the last conference I went to. It's called dysfunctional eating because um, we all have somewhat dysfunctional eating habits. Um, so dysfunctional eating or disordered eating is uh, my specialty. So today I want to give y'all a new perspective on physical and mental health. I was telling a few of you guys before um, most of y'all showed up that my hope is y'all leave today as a little, a little part of my anti-diet army. Okay. So the idea is that once you learn what you learned today, my hope is that you go out and the baton is passed and you will go spread the words with your family, your loved ones, your work your clients, right? So that's kind of the goal is that this will maybe like reinform how you define health and, and maybe thinking, it, thinking of it in a different way. Okay, so a new perspective on physical and mental health, eating disorder dietitian edition. Um, today I'll be talking a little bit about um, anti-diet nutrition philosophies and the science behind them. These will include health at every size, intuitive eating, joyful movement, and all foods fit. And I will also discuss how these principles apply to you, your work, and your family. So this is my face. Um, I already gave y'all a little bit of my background, um, but I do start every um, presentation by discussing a little bit of my approach. Um, my approach is FBT or family-based treatment, um, but the modified approach, um, classical FBT does not include the dietitian. Um, so I do like a more family-focused care model when I see clients, so more of the, the family system. Um, health at every size, intuitive eating, and body image work. And I also like to call out my privilege. So I am coming into the room as a cisgender heterosexual female um, that's white and has thin privilege. So with that being said, everything that I inform you guys about today or everything I teach you guys about today is coming through that lens, okay? So these are nutrition like philosophies. I am an expert on nutrition. I am not an expert on your lived experience and how these apply to you. So I would like for you guys to have conversations with me throughout this, especially since we're in a kind of smaller setting. Basically, I go ahead and comment questions <laughs> and I'll answer them later. Um, but at the end of the day, this is kind of the lens in which I practice. And so in any time I'm going into a session, going into a speaking engagement, I want you to know that y'all are going to have different takes on what I'm teaching you. And that's okay. And that's also what we're here to redefine is that a lot of times the classical health model um, doesn't take into account that. 
component, right? So that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. Um, so what does health mean to you? So I don't know the last time that most of my clients, um, my family, like my mom, my dad, has sat there and just we've sat there and we talked about well, what is health, right? So we think about health, what are the first few words that come up? I'm actually calling you guys. What are the first few words like health? First words, go. Longevity. Longevity. Happy. Happy. Balance. Balance. Exercise. Exercise. Strong. Strong. Pain free. Pain free. Okay. So these are a lot of words that I actually hear a lot of my clients. I'll ask my clients. So what's health mean to you? Help define it, right? So if we think about what health means to us, these are words that I like, I actually like Google the, the definition. So let's just get the definitions out of the way. So let's define health. Oxford language defines health as a state of being uh, free from illness or injury or a person's mental or physical condition. Okay, it's pretty basic. Um, Merriam Webster as the condition of being sound in body, mind, or spirit. And then the World Health Organization as complete physical, mental, and social well being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I've never actually used that word before. Um, so these are the words that I have my clients that have come in session that they typically use. So typically health is, or they aim for being fit, being thin slash skinny, eating clean, incorporating superfoods, guilt-free, healthy diet, macros, fruits and vegetables. And these are the things that like a lot of times my clients associate with health. We hear that in social media, out in the public, in marketing, et cetera. We typically want to avoid to be, quote, healthy, processed food, junk foods, cheat day, calories, carbs, fats, sinful things, uh, sugar, and being bloated, right? Those are things that we, like, don't associate with at all. So let's, huh? That's all the good food. Exactly. So what is the definition of health missing? You right? And all of the dimensions that make you human. So if we think about the dimensions of wellness, I found this online and I actually adore this um, like kind of imagery, but UC Davis dimensions of wellness includes the spiritual, emotional, occupational, intellectual, environmental, financial, social, and physical, right? So these are all of the parts of health that a lot of times healthcare providers like physicians, right? Or nurses or like the science that you read online does not take into account, right? If we think about BMI, we think about like a lot of health recommendations, it's typically BMI, everyone who's 5'5 five five should weigh X amount, right? That's silly, not everyone who's 5'5 five five has the same genetics, socioeconomic background, same, all of these components, emotional, spiritual, occupational, all of the same kind of beliefs. And actually, I'm not gonna talk too much about BMI today, so we get too started on it, yeah. but it was actually studied in white men in France, and most of us in this room are not white French men. <laughs> so at the end of the day, BMI does not take into account a lot of the population. So that's why um, a lot of the diagnoses that are thrown around the word obesity, right? All of kind of the language, overweight um, is really antiquated and doesn't actually kind of capture the full picture of what health means. So how does nutrition fit into this definition? Um, as a dietitian, um, an eating disorder specialist, I'm thinking of y'all's eating habits, clients' eating habits, eating habits in general on ter in terms of the spectrum. So if we think about the eating behavior spectrum, all the way on this side is kind of what we think of as positive or normal eaters, right? So it's people that eat when they're hungry, stop when they're full. Oh, that sounds good. I'll have some of that today, right? Um, that's a positive eater, right? Inconsistent eater, this is probably where I fall, and I will fully own this. Right? And so this is still normal, right? So inconsistent eaters are people that are probably so busy that they are running around and they're like, oh my gosh, it's already two o'clock. I totally like was driving around during lunch, missed lunch. When you end up eating, it's not that you're like skipping lunch to avoid calories or food or whatever. When you end up eating, you eat probably more than you would have had at 12 because you're starving, right? You're not limiting what you're eating, you're eating what sounds good, but it's not consistent, right? It's very inconsistent. You're not having it at consistent times of day. You're not being intentional with the self-care of nourishing your body consistently, right? So this is still considered normal, um, but there may, you may have days where they have an unhealthy relationship with food in their body. Still considered normal. Disordered eaters, right? So this is where kind of the new terminology, dysfunctional eating. Um, this is when bad diets kind of come into it, right? I will tell you right now, most of our population is dysfunctional or disordered. Okay. So this is when bad diets and like these sneak in, 
right? Bad diets can be like, oh, carbs are bad, right? Or, oh, I'm not have any dessert tonight. I'm trying to be healthy. That's dysfunctional, right? Because if that sounds good, or if your like, blood sugars are low, or like whatever reason your body is craving carbs in that moment, it's craving it for a reason, right? So disordered eaters, it is at this stage that relationship with food begins to have a negative impact on themselves or others. And people in this stage often begin being interested in fad diets. So this is not where it's totally taken over their life, but this is where it's starting to impact it. So um, in adolescence, I typically see this as um, if you guys are going out to eat, they always used to order the mac and cheese and think that they really liked it. And all of a sudden they're ordering something different, maybe a little bit healthier or like kind of a different option, right? Or they're like, oh, I can't, I don't eat out tonight, but I don't eat at home. Or like, you know what I mean? Like they're avoiding maybe hanging out with friends or they're not eating at Chick-fil-A, they're gonna eat before they go to Chick-fil-A, but they still end up going. Um, eating disorder is when they're not even like, they're not gonna go hang out with their friends, they start isolating, they start avoiding kind of those like social interactions around food. Um, typically, like a lot of times in my class, I see families wanting to go out to dinner and they would be every Friday night and have pizza night as a family. And all of a sudden they're like, no, I don't, I don't do pizza, right? Or, oh, I can't do pizza night tonight. I actually gotta go like study or sleep or hang out in my room, right? And they'll go either exercise, sleep because they're depressed or whatever it may be. So this is when it's starting to actually affect their social relationships affects their ability to eat things that they used to enjoy or things that they still enjoy, but they feel like they shouldn't or they feel guilty for having, right? So this is like really that destructive and threatening um, part is what the eating disorder um, kind of is defined as. And anywhere on the spectrum, you can fall at any given time, right? So for example, like most of the days, I'm probably pretty inconsistent. There's probably some times in my life where I'm more of a positive eater. I always like to tell the joke, um, and I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more later, but um, I got married almost a year ago today. And during that month of October, I know, during that month of October, I don't think I, I cooked a single meal at my house, right? Because I was so busy. I was playing a wedding, you know. So like, I was so busy. So I was very inconsistent. But then as soon as I got back, I was like, oh, stress is gone. Now I can be very consistent and intentional. And I've had more kind of time. So you can fall anywhere on this spectrum, um, but this is a really good way of kind of visualizing this kind of area right here is when people are coming to treatment or a specialist. Okay. I see clients all the way from here and beyond, but the inconsistent eaters, this is typically I'm seeing them if they're like athletes or they're wanting to like improve kind of performance or things of that sort. Okay, so the origin of disordered eating. So since that is the lens in which I operate and that is my specialty, I wanted to kind of explain a little bit of the background of disordered eating and how it develops in our population, okay? So if we think about, the, the, some of y'all are therapists in here, right? I know a few of you. Okay, most of y'all are therapists is what I'm saying. So y'all are very familiar with the biopsychosocial model right? Probably the bane of your existence. Um, so with the biopsychosocial model, for those of y'all that are not kind of therapeutic um, minded or that don't have that background, it takes into account the so social part of it, the psychological part of a human, and the biological part of a human. This is the perfect storm. So when all three of these factors kind of are combined, it's the perfect storm that develops disordered eating, um, similar to the perfect storm that develops anxiety, depression, self-harm, et cetera. I would say disordered eating or eating disorders are coping skills, not good ones, but coping skills, right? So they're unhealthy ways of coping with a deeper rooted kind of concern, problem, et cetera. So what's interesting with this biopsychosocial model is the social part is the pressure to be thin slash muscular, bullying slash teasing, and lack of social support. That is literally everywhere all the time. Yeah everywhere now right so this part of our little venn diagram is taken care of that means you only have to have two things fall in place before someone develops cancer that's crazy right and so if we go to this on the psychological component perfectionism difficulty regulating emotions and body dissatisfaction hi we all have perfectionistic clients or loved ones right we all have different fun personalities for a reason so this Right? Perfectionism is everywhere. And then the last one is biological, genetic. So there is a genetic component. Um, neonatal complications. So if they're born prematurely, having difficulty like latching, failure to thrive. And then this last one, history of dieting. 
literally everyone, right? So disordered eating, unfortunately, is running rampant. Like we're seeing so such high increase of needing to come to treatment, needing support from an outpatient team, et cetera. And that is because it is this perfect storm. Okay, so the, the main thing and the reason I'm kind of calling y'all like my anti-diet army is because if we can do anything to disrupt, right, or help kind of correct or guide to healthy coping skills, we can hopefully disrupt this perfect storm. Okay, so these are the, the beliefs that we're going to go through. Anti-diet will be the first one I kind of touch on. So anti-diet, um, and when y'all get this PowerPoint, I will send it out. You can put it on um, Facebook or whatever. Um, any of the arrows, you can actually click, and it comes up with a video. So any of the arrows on the slides are videos. So and as an anti-diet dietitian, what does this mean? Diets are dangerous. So at least 95% of weight loss through dieting is often regained, and oftentimes more weight is gained back. So let's talk about the science of this, okay? Um, there's more words on here, but I'm just gonna explain it. So if we think about dieting from a cellular level, so in your body, your cells, do they know that you're dieting? Or do they think that you're in the Great Depression, the potato famine, mm -hmm. in the middle of the desert, mm -hmm. right? They had no idea. They're like, oh my God, my, my humans in the Sahara, I need to protect them. So I'm going to slow everything down and just ration enough energy to get them until we get to this next oasis or whatever they're called in deserts, yeah. right? So we're going to make sure we get them to this next part. So I'm only going to give them enough energy for life-giving functions, right? So let's think of organs that are life-giving. The heart, duh. Um, <laughs> lungs, brain, kind of, kind of, <laughs> kind of. Uh, the intestines, kind of, right? There's like so many things that like, they, each organ has some essential functions, but some of them are not. So if we think about what does that manifest as if it is only giving energy to life-giving organs? So I joke that it only gives it to some of the brain. That's because the hind brain or the back of the brain that handles survival, that's pretty necessary. The prefrontal cortex or the front part of your brain that handles personality decisions, mood, etc. that is not essential. So typically in our clients and clients that have malnutrition, you're seeing a lot of like apathy or RBF, and I will not say the actual word, but RBF. <laughs> so like not a lot of emotion, kind of like the soft looking face, right? Mm -hmm. And that's because the body's like, I can live and be grumpy, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I can't live without my heart. So I have to give my energy there. Equally so, it sends energy to, so we're sending it to the core organs. This is the trunk of the body. You can live without your arms and your legs. Not ideally, but you can, right? So I actually, I always like to do this with people. So what you'll do is what I'll do with some clients is something called capillary refill. So what you'll do is you'll squeeze your hand as hard as you can and you open it up. And the amount of time it takes for it, it's kind of dark here, so you can't really see it. The amount of time it takes for it to go from white back to pink is obviously how quickly your blood kind of reperfused um, in your hand. Clients with malnutrition, anorexia, or who are dehydrated slash cold, um, that takes a lot longer. Okay, and most people should happen within a few seconds, but those clients take several seconds. Okay, um, another thing, hormones. Right, so the reproductive system. If I'm in the Sahara, I don't need to have another mini me in the Sahara, so I'm gonna shut that off. So reproductive systems totally kind of shut down. That's why we typically see like absence of menses. Um, in clients with uh, eating disorders or malnutrition. Um, there's so many other kind of functions, the gut slows, et cetera, but there's a lot of things. And, and the reason we have all of this research, and there's there's more research that we have in, in mice and, and all of that kind of stuff, but I always like human studies because that obviously we're humans. Yeah. Uh, so it's not ethical, who would have thought, <laughs> to <laughs> starve people. So this is only one study that we have. It was done way, way back in the day when they didn't have that kind of <laughs> ethics. Um, it's called the Minnesota Starvation Study. So the Minnesota Starvation Study was done in World War II. Um, and I like to give the science of, of kind of where this is all coming from. So in World War II, they wanted to study the effects on uh, war stricken areas, prisoner, prisoners of war, etc. Okay, so with that, they had to start people. So they had 30 men, they said you can either enlist or you can do a study. And they're like, okay, I'll do a study, right? So they lived in a compound, they starved them, right? And then they studied a lot of uh, biometrics, et cetera. And so all of, the, all of the details are up here. But what they found is that in these men, none of which had eating disorders, 
or any disordered eating before they came in, they all developed eating disorder behaviors. Okay, so you'll see the, the physiologic changes is decreased metabolic rate, which we already talked about, the rationing of energy, psychological changes, increased irritability, inability to focus, depression, apathy, hysteria, um, preoccupation, obsession with food. Um, those are a lot of things that we see in, in the mental health field, right? Okay, as a dietitian, I think my biggest call to action for therapists in the room and on Facebook or wherever um, is that when we have a client that we feel like is getting stuck, Let's reevaluate if they're eating enough. Okay. That is the biggest thing is a lot of times clients get stuck points where they're just like, oh man, we're just not progressing. They're not, they don't feel like they're engaged in, in therapy with me, whatever. But I think that like me, that's where that redefining of health. Yes, that is one part of it that can be their mental health. But also if we think about the dimensions of health, I like to think of it in three categories, like biocyte. There's the mental health, physical health, and social health. Right. If any of those are out of whack, they're going to say stuff. Okay. So that's kind of the biggest thing. So they they had psychological changes, and then these are just incredibly telling. So they started collecting recipes because back then they didn't have TikTok and things. <laughs> they started collecting recipes, being obsessed with cookbooks, chewing excessive uh, chewing gum, binge purge behaviors, cutting food into tiny pieces, and eating slow at meals. So those are all disordered eating behaviors that took place because of malnutrition. Okay, so with this study and the best actual like synopsis of the study that I've ever found is in a book called The Epit Diet, but it's not Epit, it's a bad word. Um, <laughs> I, if you are a page and okay with cussing, please read it. Um, but there's, a, there's a, a, a little story in there of this individual who was in the study and he actually had suicidal ideation, active, suicidal ideation, threatened his life. They took him to a psychiatric hospital after two weeks of being too fed. Totally back to normal. No, none of the psychological kind of symptoms, components that he had been um, experiencing thus far. So long story short, I highly recommend you guys look into this. I just wanted to explain the science behind why we're so um, keen on making sure malnutrition is addressed early on. Um, malnutrition and effect on the body, it is a multi-organ system problem that exists in all active eating disorder clients, regardless of weight loss. So again, even just take the eating disorder part out of it, you can look around you, and this will kind of lead into our next conversation. If you look around you, like, I think in, in our, our brain and, and the stigma that we have about eating disorders is that like anorexia is the main diagnosis, right? We're restricting, which is very emaciated. People in all size bodies can have restrictive behaviors. Malnutrition is not giving your organs and your body enough to eat. So the biggest thing that I like to make sure we discuss, and, and it hopefully it doesn't start playing. Yeah, I think it's something. Um, it'll play a video if you, when you guys get the slideshow um, and you can click on it. This is, you just actually click on here, there's not an arrow. Um, but the idea of health at every size. So that is one of the principles that I also want you guys to come away with having a, a good kind of overview of. So health at every size is exactly as it sounds. You can be healthy at any size. Okay. So what this what this video is going to explain is it explains when you watch this, it explains it in terms of dogs. Okay. I love dogs. We love Dale. Um, the sweet, sweet baby over there. But if we think about dogs, we don't expect Dale. Right, who's for those of you who can't see him, a big <laughs> golden doodle. We do not expect him and a chihuahua to weigh the same, to eat the same, to have the same lifespan, the same health risks. So, why do we do that for humans? I wish he was saying it would be cheaper. It would be cheaper, it would be cheaper, but we don't, right? We were fully aware that a great Dane, a great Pyrenees, and a chihuahua, a boxer, right? All the dog breeds have different body sizes have different health risks, have different everything, right? But then in humans, we're like, oh, everyone who's 5'5 five five should weigh blank. What? Right? That does not take into account at all our genetics, right? Um, where our families came from, socioeconomic status, everything that I had to talk about at the beginning. So that is the biggest thing in terms of health at every size is the idea that health can mean much more than just numbers on the page. Health is everything. And I always like to say the, the my, one of my favorite conversations to have with clients that are further along in recovery or clients that just come to me for more wellness stuff is the idea that they're like, well, my weight's changing. 
typically I don't let them weigh themselves. Um, but the, the weight is changing. And I'm like, okay, so weight gain or loss can just be more of a mirror that something bigger is happening, right? So if we think of the three aspects of health, mental, social, physical, right? Are any of those out of whack? Oh yeah, actually I've been isolating a lot more. Okay, so your mental health is not very good, meaning that you're probably either coping with food, not leaving your room and doing any movement, right? Not getting like social exposure, cultural exposure, connecting with your family and loved ones, right? That's out of whack. So instead of us focusing on quote, changing your weight, we are focusing on a number instead of focusing on the bigger systemic problem. Right, so that is how we want to redefine health thinking of so what's actually going on because me saying uh, when a doctor sees you for a 15 minute appointment and say oh just go lose weight. They're missing the fact that all of these other things are happening in that client's lives that is not being addressed so that's why it's so important to have that kind of multidisciplinary team multidisciplinary kind of approach to defining what health is. This is my favorite quote. If we all ate exactly the same way and exercised the exact same way, our bodies would still be good. So why do we think that my fitness pal giving you calorie recommendations? Why do we think that's like, oh, yep, that makes sense. Every single person that's very needs to be eating blank calories, right? No. Um, the biggest thing that like, and I don't typically talk about calories, um, but I will give you guys this one thing. Um, in um, some of the books that I can recommend to you guys after Sick Enough by Dr. Gaudiani is a good one, and The Ethics Eye, those are kind of the two that I, I like to quote the most. Um, but in there, it goes through kind of the science of malnutrition and physiology and metabolism and everything. Um, a two year old child or a small child needs more than 1600 calories a day. Okay, the Minnesota starvation study that we just said, did y'all see how many calories it said for, for starvation? 1600. If 1600 calories is starvation, and my fitness pal is telling you, who's walking, breathing, doing life, to eat 1200? Yeah. Does that make sense? No. No. So at the end of the day, the reason I don't talk about calories just for, for y'all's awareness is because when we eat in tune with what our body tells us, right? And um, I'm actually skipping ahead and I'll go back, I promise. When we eat in tune with what our body is telling us, we're eating intuitively, right? And there's a reason why we're hungry then, right? Our hunger cues are telling us something for a reason, right? The ghrelin, leptin, there's a science behind hunger cues, right? And if it's not physical hunger, then maybe it's an emotional hunger, right? Maybe it's like emotionally, I'm needing a need to be met, an emotional need to be met right now, and that I'm getting from this food, right? So instead of being like, judgmental of yourself, feel that shame, guilt, et cetera, that we typically feel because society we've told, been told, oh, you feel hungry, drink water. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's like, oh, you have to pee? I'll oh, just hold it. No, when we have to pee, we go pee. Why can't we do that with our hunger cues, right? So at the end of the day, Intuitive Eating is a book by Elise Reich and Evelyn Triboli. These are the principles. Um, they don't explicitly say this in the book, but I, they, they build upon each other. So you start at the beginning of the book, rejecting the diet mentality. Hi, welcome to chapter one. Y'all are hopefully doing that right now, right? Rejecting the idea that what you've been fed by social media, doctors, et cetera, right, is the only way, right? So if you haven't done that, how are you gonna honor your hunger? You haven't rejected the idea that if you're hungry, oh, just drink water, right? Then if you actually feel hungry, you're not actually going to honor it. So the idea of with clients in session, I'm, I'm typically working through this book, but I'm not doing like a book club. I just like subconsciously, I'm like, okay, well, this doesn't make sense. You haven't made a piece of food. How are you going to feel full? Because you're just going to feel anxious, which is going to mask your fullness, which is going to make you more anxious and so on, right? So this is a really, really important thing to kind of keep in mind. So more than anything, so in terms of those principles we just went through, the biggest takeaway message, so if you fell asleep online, wake up. Uh, <laughs> y'all, it is the one thing I want y'all to take from today. It's like the one thing I tell parents, I'm like, I don't care if you didn't listen the whole session, this is it, okay? Now I have your attention, okay. <laughs> take morality out of it. The language that we use, take morality out of it. So moral language being good versus bad, healthy versus unhealthy, clean versus dirty. 
I, I don't really even know what the opposite of clean is in food, <laughs> right? Dirty food, I don't know. Uh, gross, don't eat that, huh? <laughs> the dirty doesn't. The dirty doesn't, yeah, or junk. That would be like the, the dirty version of food. So anyways, do the cells that make up your body. So again, going back to that cellular level, do they think in terms of moral value? Were they like, wow, Mackenzie, really? <laughs> you got your glucose from a cookie? No, it was like, thank you so much for the glucose. I'm going to go do my thing, right? So that is the idea of all foods fit. It is the idea that all foods fit and balance variety and moderation. Now, my husband laughs at this every time I show him the slide. He's like, wait, I want to be not to say it. I'm like, yeah, I know. But your cells get glucose from both of them, right? Now, for those of y'all that are like, but really, they're not the same. Okay, you're right. This provides, so an apple provides physical body benefits. It benefits your body, benefits your cells, provides fiber, vitamins, minerals, helps your food, helps your cholesterol, all the things, right? Physically, it's very beneficial. Cake provides emotional benefits, right? It's providing culture. Maybe you're making the cake with your grandma. Just tastes good. It's your birthday, right? All of those are emotionally very beneficial. So if you live your whole life and you're only eating cake, maybe you'll be really happy, <laughs> but you'll feel like crap, right? But if you live your whole life and you're only eating an apple, that means you're going to a birthday party and having an apple while everyone's having cake? Question mark? Yeah. Right? That makes literally no sense. That would be a very sad life. Yes. Right. So you have to have balance. And now I do like to think about balance. When I say about right and eating this sort of treatment, it is very much a plate. Like we're looking like, do you have all the food groups on your plate? As intuitive eaters, it's a little different. So think back to, again, this time last year, I was getting married. I didn't cook at my house once. I ate out every single day because I was stressed, yeah. right? That is not balance. If you took a snapshot of Mackenzie, the dietitian's life in October of 2021, there was zero balance. However, if you look at my 20 something years on this earth, it is incredibly balanced. Even if you look at the, the three months around my wedding, after I got home, I was like, oh my God, we cannot afford to eat out all the time. And I'm so sick of Chick-fil-A, <laughs> right? So that is balance, the idea that if you listen to what your body wants, if you have a day where you're on vacation or you're at a conference, I was at a conference, you were talking about it before I came in, I was at a conference last week, um, I had to eat out every day, right? And there weren't always fruits and vegetables. I think I went two, three days, four days without fruits and vegetables. That was not balanced, but I came back, that is all I crave. That is literally all I wanted when I got back. I was like, come please, let's go to Salada. Right? That is also, again, like I said, playing to intuitive eating is the idea that your body will find balance if you just listen. Okay. Um, obviously, you have to be intentional, and that's also what I'm here. I wouldn't have a job if it was really that easy. <laughs> right? There are distractors, there are other things going on in our mental and physical health that distract us from that. But that is kind of the basic principles. So these are more take home messages um, that I want you guys to be able to like have, print off, whatever kind of summarizing how this applies to you and your family. So A, don't diet. I hope that I've given you enough science and research to think that dieting is silly, right? Because all it's doing is putting your body in the desert. And then when you get out of the desert, it's like, oh, thank God, we're out of the desert. I'm just going to hold on to everything ever because I want to protect from the next famine, right? So that yo-yo dieting, the more you put yourself in a desert, out of the desert, desert, out of the desert, your body's like just learning to cope because its whole point is to make sure you survive. So the whole point is that it's going to hold on to more to protect you from the next time it's happening because it's happened every January 1st <laughs> since you turned 18, right? So of course it's going to be like, oh, okay, this comes every year. It's just the winter famine, right? Even though it's called the New Year's resolution. Um, <laughs> so anyways, that is that. Um, listening to your body. So this is the hunger fullness skill that I use with my clients. Um, it's, there's all of the kind of, um, logos of the blogs that I got my stuff from. Um, so the hunger fullness scale, I like for my adolescents to kind of be thinking in terms of hunger fullness. So it is important to kind of aim to start a meal at a three. So hungry, stomach growling, needing energy, right? Um, not waiting until we're a one and feeling ravenous because then our body is in animalistic mode. So if we really think about turning into like Dale or a dog, right? When a dog is hungry, like those rescue dogs, 
Have you seen those dodo videos or those Facebook videos of the dogs that are rescued in the first few days? Like, they're like defending their food, right? That's what's happening when clients from malnutrition are coming out of malnutrition. So if you've ever worked with a client who has an eating disorder or coming out of eating disorder, typically pretty sad, right? Um, and I actually totally skipped over that part. I'm a recovered clinician myself. So I myself had an eating disorder growing up. Um, and so a lot of what I'm teaching you today are things I wish my family knew. Um, it feels like an outer body experience when you're going through an eating disorder and you wish you could just tell your mom, like, I want to eat the cake, but I physically feel like I cannot, mm -hmm. right? So that, that one on the ravenous scale, clients with, uh, with eating disorder can really stay in that kind of headspace, that animalistic, like everything is a threat kind of mindset for several months. And that's kind of why dietitians like myself come into play and so a four would be where you would start a snack i could eat it's kind of empty but i'm not like super hungry right and then you want to end a meal at a seven satisfied if you eat any more you'll feel uncomfortable right and you want to end a snack at a six so mild fullness stomach feels full but you don't feel totally satisfied because you know you're gonna have dinner in a few hours right um so listening to your body is very important <laughs> movement so this is one of the principles that i didn't actually have its own side for but the idea of joyful movement so i define it here joyful movement is an approach to physical activity that emphasizes finding pleasure in the ways we move our body it is in direct opposition to the philosophy that advise going to the gym to earn food okay so movement this is a huge one for me because i i during my eating disorder and when I developed it, I was an athlete, just playing soccer. It was not as clear to me back in the day that movement could be joyful. And yes, I enjoyed soccer, right? But joyful movement is the idea that if you don't love what you're doing movement-wise, you're not going to keep doing it. So when a physician's like, oh, diet and exercise, right? Then you're instantly just probably like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym. What if you hate the gym? Yeah, <laughs> same sometimes. <laughs> Uh, so if you hate the gym, you're going to do it again, January 1, your New Year's resolution. They always joke, right? Gym memberships will go up. Everyone will do it for two weeks, and they're like, well, this sucks. And then they're going to stop. What if for you, joyful movement is gardening? Have y'all ever dug a hole? <laughs> that is so hard. Oh, my gosh. I got, when I got a house during COVID, I was like, oh, my gosh. This is like a better workout than anything, right? So gardening can be joyful movement. Dancing could be joyful with the dancing in your kitchen. Have you ever vacuumed your house from start to finish? Man, your bicep is sore, right? So like joyful movement can look different to different people. You just have to find joy in it because the benefits that you will get physically from doing that movement from now until you're 99 will be much greater than having a burst of a month and a half at the gym once a year, right? Even if it's less intense, even if it's a walk. And things of that sort, right? So that is something very important to remind ourselves. So if you have teens, I usually work with teens. It's like my population that I enjoy working with. Um, a lot of them are not going to want to go for a walk, right? Maybe a walk isn't joyful. Maybe they don't want to. They don't know what is joyful to them. Yeah. Help them get plugged into social groups that'll explore that with them. Going and like playing with friends, playing soccer, kicking the, like the soccer ball around. Um, Pokemon Go was a big one back in the day. I don't know if it's still a thing, but if they're really big in video games, they have to do Pokemon Go or anything of that sort. So that is what joyful movement is, and it's very important that we have it. Um, in terms of social media, how do you think social media can be positive and negative? Have y'all, I mean, I'm sure that everyone in here has thought about that. Um, there's a video here um, on the video. It's actually very, very um, interesting. It's one of the Dove campaigns. So Dove, like, yes, to soap, the chocolate, all things. Um, they have a campaign uh, for self-esteem. This video is really, really important. I'm not even going to try to explain it. Please go watch it. So when y'all post, um, you can post all the things on y'all socials, like any links to videos and stuff. Um, post that. Go look at it. But the biggest one that I actually can explain, so this is a body image video. Um, they, uh, Dove, another Dove campaign, had a sketch artist, a true crime sketch artist, so if you're a true crime junkie like myself, love that, yes, okay, I see it. Um, so I was a true crime junkie, I think it was just so interesting. So what they did is they basically had a, a true crime sketch artist, I don't know what to call them, I keep saying true crime, uh, a sketch artist on one side of a sheet, 
and like a person on the other side. They had to explain to the sketch artist what they looked like. Have you seen it? Oh, it's so powerful. So it's so beautiful. So they had to explain to the person on the other side of the sheet what they looked like. So they were like, yeah, I kind of have like a, a dingy, like my skin is kind of like sagged and uh, all the freckles like, oh, they're so big and clunky. Like they were talking really negatively about themselves. And then they had someone they met like randomly. So we just met. We had studied each other's face, and then I would go on the other side of the curtain and explain that person and what they looked like. And then they would put the sketches side by side, and you could see the vibrancy. And they were actually more alike to the person, the person who had just met you and studied your face once, than the actual person themselves, because they would speak so like so poorly about themselves, etc. So please go watch this video. But another big thing that I took a little wake up if you fell asleep is this. So if we're thinking about morality. We're thinking about kind of taking moral language off. I also want us to be aware of our compliments. Okay. So now, if you mess, if you mess up, or if you say anything I'm about to say, you're not a bad person. It's also totally normal. I just want to be intentional about the compliments that we give. Okay. So when we compliment like each other, right? Typically, we'll say, "Oh my God, girl, have you lost weight? Oh, girl, you're lit. Like they look so good. Like we're commenting on body." Okay, now this is probably like my secret to success with my clients. So take it, write it down, use it yourselves again. Um, but I always tell my clients, so if your whole identity is how you look, you're gonna have an identity crisis every freaking, I mean, my body is different every day, but like every day, every month, every year from now until you're 99, right? Your identity is going to be ebbing and flowing so much. But if your identity is rooted in a value, who you are, right? So I always tell them to choose three because that's easier in a session. So three values, right? So I have mine's compassionate, goofy, and confident, right? If those are my three values, no matter if I'm 99 years old, can't even stand up, right? Like totally different, gray right? hair, maybe I'm bald, I don't know, right? From now until I'm 99, I can always be compassionate, goofy, and confident, okay? So those are things that I fuel, right? I eat to fuel those values. I can't be confident if I'm not nourished, right? I'm gonna barely be able to, to have the hind part of my brain functioning, much less the prefrontal cortex that handles personality decisions, etc. Right? I'm not gonna be goofy. I'm gonna be so I'm gonna be so focused on surviving that it's gonna be turned inward, right? So that is kind of the work. And so when you are with your loved ones, family, coworkers, clients, right? It kind of catch yourself complimenting them on what they look like and try to compliment them on things that they are, right? Like, oh my gosh, your passion when you talk about Dale, <laughs> right? Like how excited did you get when you talk about Dale? That absolutely made my day, right? Because like you, you being passionate about something is you, right? That's what makes you you. So these are some that I kind of typed up um, in inspiration with Jennifer Rowland's stuff. So you light up the room. You have the best laugh. You inspire me. I love how passionate you are, right? All of these kinds of things. So save those, use those, try to keep yourself from commenting on weight loss and body changes, right? Because you don't know what's going on behind that. Um, so really that's kind of the biggest thing that I like for y'all to take away with this. Um, and what do you suspect if someone has dysfunctional eating, eating disorder, sort of eating, plug in, whatever word for that. Be a listening ear, set up a private time and place to talk. Be honest with your concerns. Again, avoid complimenting body size or food choices. Be caring and set boundaries um, on when to refer to a specialist and encourage them to seek professional help. Um, so I was telling some of you guys, um, not only do I have the privilege of working for Connections as their eating specialist, I have a lot of different hats that I wear. And one of those is being a community resource for helping people get plugged into certain treatment for disorder eating. Um, on y'all's post, you can post my number in my email. Um, please call, text, I, I really, I always would say connections pay the bills, but I work for y'all. So whatever you guys need in terms of placing someone, if you have a loved one that you're like concerned has disordered eating, or if you have a client in one of your groups, and then there's some like group leaders in here, um, please just give them my number. I love coaching people through it because I myself have had an eating disorder. It feels very lonely um, and it feels like you can't even put it into words. So I like to joke that I'm an eating disorder translator. <laughs> um, so my clients like will sit in session with their parents, they're like, I don't even, I don't know how to say it, like, does it, does it sound accurate to you? Like, oh my gosh, yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. So all that I'm saying is make sure you know when to seek professional help, but also don't be afraid to set some time aside to listen. So thank you guys so much. Um, so all questions. <laughs> questions? I know I talk a lot. <laughs>
<laughs> so that's amazing. But yeah. good. Thank you guys. Yeah, uh, that's my favorite thing to talk about. Yeah. My husband always jokes that I go to the grocery store and they'll ask me, like, what was your favorite superfood today? And he's like, just walk away. Walk away. So, <laughs> <he's> like, I'll typically <laughs> stand there and I'll be like, well, actually, there's no superfoods. Um, <laughs> this is why. So it's funny. I've been talking about it all night. Yeah. But I think that if y'all don't have any questions, we're good. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. I appreciate it. All right, well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Um, the, I also want to thank Simone for allowing us the opportunity to host the event here at her studio. Uh, Simone is a uh, LPC and also a yoga teacher, yoga instructor, works with the yoga instructor. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to take about five or 10 minutes for her to kind of present about what they do here at A to Zen and how they could be a benefit to the community as well. Thank you. So before I start, Mackenzie, can you help me yeah. them? I had my daughter here earlier helping with the technology and now she may be walking in the door in a moment, but she went what to do you need? house for dinner. So I'm just wanting to get my computer, yes. I guess. Yes. Yeah. And then um how do I switch? Yes, I got it. I got it. Come on. Oh, okay, yeah. This just I wanted to pull up. Okay, let me stop sharing. Technical, technical delay. Please stay by while it turns your uh, program. <laughs> your regular programming. Okay, so mine should be off. Then you're going to. Oh, oh that's cool. cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Very okay. There you go. Is that good? Awesome. Yeah. Okay. I don't get my turn off. Yeah, of course. Okay, thank you all so much for coming here. Um, and first off, I just want to clarify um, I'm actually renting the space from this lovely woman right here. She's done all the decorating and she it's gorgeous. Owns it's amazing. Zen. Yeah, she owns the Edison. Now, you may have noticed when you walked in, there's a sticker on the window, very poorly placed. I was my first time putting a window sticker <laughs> up, and like, as I'm trying to get the bubbles out, I was like, oh, this looks awful. It's very temporary. But basically, the reason this place in this time is so important to me is because it's the birth of a dream, and she's really helped facilitate that for me. Now, I had this dream placed on my heart several years ago. Um, but you know how it is with dreams, like sometimes you're just like, well, yeah, tomorrow, the next day or whatever. So then this is my why. So this is my sister-in-law, Jenny. Um, she was, uh, I hope I don't cry, but I might, <laughs> you know, you'll understand. Um, so she, uh, was awarded, uh, this like best FBI agent of the United States one year by Biden because she devoted her life to breaking up sex trafficking rings mm -hmm. and just trying to protect children and women um, who were drawn into that industry. Mm -hmm. um, so she blessed me with two beautiful nephews. One just uh, went into kindergarten this year and the other one is, um, is, is seven months old now. She passed away a couple months ago, and during that time, I was just thinking, like, I really need to get on the stream, you know? Um, so she, you know, you were talking about passing the baton, and that's exactly what I, you know, I just always envisioned her, like, goodness, Jenny, like, how do I take this baton and continue on? Um, she was just so incredible, and and so I thought, okay, I got it. I got to start the stream. I got to move forward with this. Like, there's no time like today. Yeah. And so, yeah, last year I met Vanessa. Um, she's an incredible woman who has her own personal life. Um, and she's, she's my trauma coach. I knew that talk therapy only goes so far. Like, you know, you go to a 50 minute session each week and I've been at LPC for over 10 years. So, you know, you get to that place with your clients and you realize like the trauma is just stuck there. Has anyone ever read, um, uh, the body keeps the score by W. Russell Ben. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you know, but like it's it, there's there's body work that needs to happen too. So here um, we have this space where we can actually start realizing the dream of not only talking back there with my clients, but then coming back here and working on trauma release exercises, on breath work, on body work. 
And so Vanessa's our trauma coach. We also have um, a behavioral coach who helps just call and check in throughout the week, make sure. I don't know either if y'all assign homework to your clients, but I used to do it. I don't do it so much anymore. It's not good for some of the time. They're like, I didn't do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's that accountability factor and that community factor that we need. So um, we also do fitness classes here. Um, there's uh, different kinds of uh, fitness classes that are geared more towards confidence building. It's not, it's not about the shape, right? It's, um, it's about just finding that joyful movement, like you said, um, and finding confidence and safety in our bodies again. Um, so, so really, this team, the Stella Maris Center, that messed up sticker on the window, it represents a dream. And it's a team of passionate women that are trying to come together and help heal hearts through the mind-body connection. Um, so if y'all are um, interested in joining our community, um, you can just get out your phone, um, text me. My number um, is 214-640-0651. And we'll keep you up to date on all the things. <clears throat> Thanks so much. So we will actually be back here in February in order to do uh, another presentation uh, with the Stone Mare Center and possibly even doing some yoga. Love it. Yes, love it. I'm still trying to get her into the whole goat yoga thing. <laughs> so fun. We can do Dale yoga. Yeah. 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 Puppy yoga. Yeah. Yeah. Puppy yoga. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone ever done goat yoga before? No, I yes. I did it for my birthday one year. It was so fun. So I don't know if he's ever done it before, but maybe he could, yeah, dog yoga. Yeah. He can jump on our backs. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. Really hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll stop with the dad jokes. Uh, our next monthly meeting is going to be uh, next month, November 3rd. That will actually be at the Irving uh, Art Center where we're doing the PTSD 911 uh, world premiere. And then after that, we will be doing a holiday party in December as our monthly meeting. Okay, so stay tuned for that. I want to thank everyone for coming out. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, stay active. All right. Here you go. Who had no good questions? Oh, um, can we wave? Do it for us. Oh my gosh. Wave. Peter. Oh my God. Did you say that he prays? Did I hear that? Yes, it's so cute. Sit. Sit. Oh, oh, that was it. Print. Oh, my God. <laughs> He's a cute boy. The organization that trains him, they do that with all the dogs, but not all the dogs pick up on that trick. Oh, so they joke that those dogs special. are animals. <laughs> Special boy. All right. Well, thank you all everyone for coming yes, out thank and you being part of this you. and learning about uh, the new way to look at diet and going out that word and just worrying about the mind, body, and health connection.